name's Ron Patterson, University of Idaho Extension Horticulture Educator in Bonneville County. I've lived, I grew up in Rexburg, and so it's a cold, cold area over here. We were lucky if we got tomatoes ripening on the vine, but usually we ripen most of our tomatoes in the garage. And so uh, uh, extending the season is something that has always interested me. But there are some things that we can do, even in a short growing season, to kind of get our, speed up the growth of our plants. So we're going to talk about extending the, the growing season. And there's a couple of, uh, well, my objective is in to uh, talk a little bit about the types of season extension and how to extend that season. We can do it uh, physical, cultural, different uh, physical or cultural things that we can do to extend that growing season. And then uh, management of some of these extension, season extension tools. The question is, what is season extension? When we think about it, we're increasing the number of producing days. So if, if we're looking at it from a, a land point of view, it's actually quite easy to do that. All we're doing is we're going to be gardening longer, but we're not really saying we're just going to be using the ground for a longer period of time. So that's pretty easy to do to, to extend the season for the land itself. But if we're going to do it for individual crops like tomatoes or peppers or you know some of those warm season crops, then it gets to be more of a challenge. You can even talk about extending the season for your cool season crops, such as uh, spinach and, and lettuce, especially get over there in the Canyon County area over in the Treasure Valley area getting the cool season crops to grow farther into the summer, it gets quite hot over there. And so they just, they just kind of peter out in the summertime. And so we can also talk a little bit about extending the growing season for the cool season crops as well as the warm season crops. But usually we're talking about the warm season crops. That's the one that everybody is all excited about. So we can get some tomatoes in some of our high, high desert country that we have here in, in Eastern Idaho, especially. Now, one of the things to, to think about then when we're talking about extending the season for the ground or for the garden is that we have three garden seasons. We have the spring garden season where we're typically growing cool season crops. And we have the summer garden season where we're growing our more tender crops. And then we have uh, our fall garden season. We're back kind of into the cool season crops again. And so, so if we think about having not just a garden plot, but a garden season that will help us a little bit to extend that growing for that garden itself. So uh, the whole key here is to plant the crops when they do best with that natural environment, the, the climate that, that we're giving them. And so with the hardy crops, those are the ones that tolerate some frost, things like that. You go early spring, and late, late summer, maybe a little bit early fall, but we don't really worry about those hardy crops. Most of those hardy crops don't do well in a hot part of the summer. So we don't try to push them into that season. The semi-hardy crops can kind of, they don't like it really cold, but they will tolerate frost. And then we get into the fall, we can get that, but they still struggle a little bit in the middle of the summer. Now the tender crops, that's when there's no chance of frost. Basically, as a matter of fact, a lot of times you'll get damaged just from chilling, not, not freezing, but getting down under 40 degrees on some of these plants, you'll get some damage on the fruit and things like that, that you don't really like to see on these very tender crops. And so when there's no chance of frost, that's what we're looking at with the tender crops. So again, looking at that gardening season, the, the, the three different seasons of gardens, gardening, that's very important. Now, keep be careful when you're doing this, be careful of rotation. Say, for example, if you're doing a, a plot in your garden with cool season crops and you're going to do a spring and a fall cool season crop with just a little break maybe in between in the summertime where you put some cover crop or something in the ground, you don't want to be following the same crop each time you want to put something different in that same spot so that we don't get a, a season or soil disease build up on the other kind of disease or, or insect pest build up in that particular location. So you still want to be thinking about crop rotation even within that same growing season. Now here's kind of a calendar 
of how you might look at this. You've got in in your early season, you got cover crops and I always, it's, you know, we talk about having something on the ground, cover, protecting kind of an armor over the top of the soil, a, a live root in the soil as long as possible. Those kinds of things really help with the soil health and help the, to build up the, the resiliency of that soil that so that we can have a good good production so I, I always put in cover crops and you have a shady uh, an open space not that i always have the time to get it into my garden but if you can work these cover crops in there or you may do some what's called solarization uh, we'll talk well that's more of a weed control kind of a thing but you can put it's basically it's clear plastic over the ground heats up the ground and it'll kill weed seeds in the top layer of the soil, some of the weed seeds, not all the weeds will are affected by this solarization. But anyway, so here's some rotation kinds of things. You got your cover crops, your hardy crops, you can plant in even into February over in, in uh, Canyon County, you can plant those out in February and and they will do quite well. Get them in and uh, cover them into, into November in the fall. And so that's, you get this one spot in your garden, say this year, I'm going to have this 10 by 20 piece of my garden is going to be these hardy crops. And so you plant them and you kind of rotate that through there. Another section of the garden, you could say, okay, we're gonna do the semi hardy crops. There's still not a whole lot of time in the middle. This is what I'm gonna focus on is the semi hardy crops. And then if you're going to do the tender crops, another part of the, part of the garden, you say, okay, well, I'm gonna do hardy crops early in the season. And then as I get ready to put out my tender crops, I'll terminate that hardy crop and put in my tender crops and have them be producing. And so you can have this whole, you're, you're extending the growing season because of the way that you're doing this. Uh, one important thing to do, especially over here in eastern Idaho, is to select varieties that have shorter days to maturity. So you don't want to, we don't generally have a whole lot of good luck growing popcorn over here because popcorn typically is a 100 to 120 day corn. Whereas we would typically want to be putting in something that is 90 days or less, we might be able to stretch it out to 100 days. And I know we have a longer growing season than that, but we'll talk about why why we want to pull in those shorter season days to maturity as much as possible. So when you're talking tomatoes, get those tomatoes that have a shorter days to maturity. That's kind of what we have to deal with. So, so here, let's go through some hardy, some crop examples that are hardy crops. You get your spinach, your broccoli, leeks, parsley, Brussels sprouts. Now these things will tolerate freezing as long as it doesn't get, you know, down into the teens kind of a thing. But even some of them, they won't, that won't kill them. They'll still survive. And when the ambient temperature, soil temperature is warm enough and the ambient temperature gets up to 40 degrees, they'll start growing again. So, uh, those are some some others here, your cabbage, peas, kale, kohlrabi, garlic. Garlic's one of my favorite crops to grow. Unfortunately, it's kind of tough here in Idaho to get uh, garlic that you can, you have to get it local sourced kind of a thing um, because of the quarantine issues on it. But, but it's a great crop. It's one of the first things to pop up in the springtime. You've got those green leaves that are coming up out of the ground in early, early spring. And it does tolerate that just fine and does really, really nicely. Uh, as far as if you're looking at instead of vegetables, you're looking at uh, ornamental plants, then your your bulbs, this is kind of a fun picture I took. Uh, it snowed on my daffodils right after they came out and it was kind of cool. Anyway, so your, your pansies, your bleeding heart, iris, peonies, primrose, your spring bulbs, tulips and daffodils and crocus, especially crocus, one of the first things to pop up in the springtime, they do, well, they're a cool season crop, and so they do very well. So let's move into the semi-hardy crop examples. This is where we get into lettuce and the carrots, potatoes and corn, um, and onions. Potatoes really are not, they don't tolerate frost. You get a little bit of frost on those, and those plants will burn. 
But because we have a lot of storage in the potato set that we plant down there, even if the top gets frozen in the springtime, it'll come back pretty quickly from, from a frost on the potatoes. So it's not really a semi-hardy crop. It is really quite tender, but because of the way we, we propagate it, it does quite well. Corn is quite, quite, is, is quite frost tolerant. It'll get burned down, but as long as the growing point of the corn is still down right there at or below the soil surface, so it doesn't get damaged by the frost, the corn will grow out of a frost quite easily. And we saw a lot of that two years ago when we had these late frosts in June. A lot of corn got damaged and looked like, oh, we got some serious damage on the corn, but it really quickly came out of it. It slowed it down a little bit, but it came out of that frost quite quickly. <clears throat> now onions, are they are very hardy, but the, the deal with onions is when they get to a certain size, they need this vernalization or chilling requirements or it's a biennial and it needs this vernalization to, to have it set flowers. And so sometimes, a lot of times when we plant our onions early in the season, they get growing and they do really quite well, but they get that chilling requirement. It's not a freezing requirement, it's just a chilling requirement. They get that chilling requirement and it meets that needs for it. And then all of a sudden it, we get a lot of onions bolting if we get them planted too early in the year. I, I planted quite a lot of onions in my high tunnel and I could have nice full bulbed uh, onions in June, but I got quite a few of those would bolt, would would be a set seed instead of, you know, they'll, they'll still set a bulb, but they just don't store as well and things like that. So here's some of these uh, mid, bok choy is actually quite, quite uh, hardy, but one of this pull, pulled it from says, okay, it's a kind of a semi hardy. So anyway, and then your semi hardy flowers. Again, these are flowers that will tolerate a bit of frost in the springtime. And an interesting thing about a lot of these flowers is they'll tolerate frost in the springtime. When it comes fall, you get a little, you just breathe cold on them and they start to wilt. So, so it's more of a springtime kind of a thing, but your petunias, geraniums, marigolds are one of those. Uh, you think, Oh, they, they're not that, when they get big, they're just not that tolerant of frost, but when they're small, they're actually a little bit tolerant of the frost, okay. Um, Lobelias and ageratums. And then your tender crops, this is the one, you know, people get really excited about growing these in our garden areas, but your beans and tomatoes, peppers, squash, eggplants, your cucumbers and melons and pumpkins and okra. Again, these plants, any frost at all, and you'll burn them really badly. And even the chilling requirements, you'll see you'll see chilling damage a lot of times on your tomatoes early. Your first tomatoes that come ripen on the tomato vines have had some chilling damage on them. You get some flower scars on them. And then your tender flowers, your zinnias, African daisies, and patience, heliotrope and celosia are really quite tender. Planting these plants we just talked about in the season when they will do well, that is a, a type of season extension. We're not worried about extending the season for specific crops. We're just worried about getting the most out of our land, giving the natural. And so that's quite easy. If that's what you want to do, that's a great program to follow. But now if we're going to extend for a specific crop, then we need to beat the climate. All right. So one of the things that we can do is to start seeds indoors. When, when we do that, we've got to jump on the plants. We don't have to wait for the soil to warm up in order for the seeds to germinate. So we can get that going and everything is, is ready for when the temperatures are warm enough, we can put them outside. So we've got kind of a jump on the season that way. And also then variety selection will help as well. Certain, even within species, certain varieties may be a little bit more cold hardy than other varieties. Some of the varieties that might be a little more, more sensitive to the cold. So we're going to, in order to do this, then we, we, can get, we can get the plant started and have transplants, that'll help. But a lot of times what we're talking about is modifying the environment. And we're, we're fighting against mother nature here. We're modifying the environment to meet the needs of the plants. And so with the hardy crops, you know, they tolerate the near winter conditions, but they don't like hot summer conditions. And so we'd have to figure out how to modify. It's really hard to cool down in the summer. 
And so that's a challenge there. Semi-hardy crops tolerate the chili, not really cold. They may or may not tolerate those hot summer conditions. You know, beets and chard will do really actually quite well in the summer. And so they'll, they'll actually grow through the summer and for the most part be, be good. And then the tender, tender plants, we've talked about that. So here's freeze dates. And I, this is mostly Eastern Idaho. And I apologize for you guys over in the Western part of the state. As I realize this is a busy screen, but there's different thresholds we talk about when we're talking about season extension. When we're talking about the 24 degree threshold, that's when you start seeing quite a lot of damage to fruit, depending on what stage of growth or, or reproduction they're in. You can see a fair amount of damage when you start getting at 24 degrees or colder. 28 degrees, most of your fruit trees like apples and, and peaches even and raspberries, those things will tolerate down to 28 degrees with, with maybe a little bit of damage, but not very much really at that, at that point. They'll tolerate that frost as long as it doesn't get too cold. But here's the one we really like to talk about, this 32 degree threshold. That's the one that determines the growing season length. So, you know, Pocatello is 127 days. Rexburg, uh, 126 days. I kind of question that one. <clears throat> Why would Pocatello and Rexburg be about the same? And that's probably, this was taken from a bulletin that was actually several years old. And so in that same bulletin, Spencer, Idaho, the average growing season in Spencer, Idaho is 15 days. <laughs> so, so that's a fun one. All right. <clears throat> So, but that's only half the story. We're talking about the, the frost free days is, is part of it, but that's really only half the story. We also need to be thinking about growing degree units. And these are based on a, a base temperature. So for example, your base temperature for spinach is at about 40 degrees and your base temperature for squash is going to be maybe 60 degrees. So when the temperature is below 60 degrees, the squash are not growing. They don't grow. They're not dying. They're just not growing. And so you got this, this base temperature you're talking about. And at the other end of the things, you also have upper temperatures. And so when the temperature started to get above 75 degrees for a lot of our cool season plants, they just said, ha, ah, it's too hot. I'm going to take a siesta. I don't want to grow uh, in this hot temperature. I'm going to take a nap. So the upper temperature is also... Uh, part of it. The problem with the formulas they use to determine these deg growing degree units is that they usually just talk about the base. They don't talk about that upper limit. And then the other thing that they don't talk about is the amount of time that you're in that sweet spot. So for example, here we have our cool season vegetables. Actually, no, this is warm season. This should say warm season on there. Sorry. This is your warm season vegetables. The temperatures You'll notice here your minimums 50, 60, 65 degrees. In other words, when it's below 65 degrees, your eggplant, your watermelons, your sweet potatoes, they're just, they're not going to do anything. They're just sitting there waiting for it to warm up enough for them to get out of bed. And then when you get into this 70 to 85 degree temperature range, they start growing and they grow very well. They grow fast and they very quite well. You get up above 95 to 100 degrees, it's not going to kill them, but they just stop growing. So, so you're looking at trying to get things into this optimum range for as long as possible during the day. That's where things like high tunnels really shine for your growing season. And a high tunnel is basically an unheated greenhouse. It, it gets that ambient temperature up there very quickly. And if you manage it properly, you can hold it in that sweet spot for a longer period of time during the day so that you've got more growing time each day. So the growing degree days calculations just say, okay, what they do is they take the, the high temperature, low temperature, add them together, divide by two. So you the average of those two, of course, and then you subtract the base, which you know for these would be 50 degrees for your pumpkins and your snap beans and things like that. 65 degrees for sweet potatoes. So that's kind of how they do the calculations, but that does not take into account how long you're in this sweet spot. So you can actually get a lot more growing degree units in a period of time uh, in, in a single day than just than just taking that low and the high and, and doing the calculation. So uh, and so this these are the cool season crops. Notice how much cooler 
minimum temperature is and then how much cooler the maximum temperature is in this optimum range you're looking at 60 degrees 60 65 maybe 70 degrees you're starting to get about 70 75 degrees and these things will start to shut down so you're looking at the beets and the cabbage and and things like that your carrots cauliflower all these kinds of things they do well with the cooler temperatures and so just kind of keep that in mind as you're thinking about season extension. What can I do to get that temperature into that sweet spot as quickly as possible? So again, we're talking about modifying the climate. How do we modify the climate? And there's different aspects of the climate that we really need to be thinking about when we're, when we're talking about modifying the climate. So let's look at one of the big things, of course, is protecting from frost. So that's the one we're always thinking about. You, you see the frost and, and do you know where the cold spots are in your, on your property, in your garden area? I, I, this is my second growing season here. I'm starting to find out where the cold spots are in my garden, in my yard, so I can kind of plan that and, and kind of work around that. The wind especially over here in eastern Idaho, we've got to protect against the wind in the springtime especially. So if we can protect against the wind, that helps a lot to keep our plants growing and doing very well. And so protection against the wind is, is very important. Soil temperature is really something we don't think about a whole lot, but the plants, the, you know, the seeds don't germinate till the temperatures get up, but even the roots themselves, if the soil temperatures are too cold, the roots don't grow well. So we want to warm the soil or in the case of some of the cool season crops, we maybe want to cool the soil because when it starts getting hot, we want to cool that soil down just a little bit. Ambient temperature and photosynthesis. Now photosynthesis isn't technically directly affected by ambient temperature, but some of the other processes that support photosynthesis are. So yes, photosynthesis, the temperature and photosynthesis really have kind of have a, a bearing on it. It's not just the the base threshold on, on the specific plants, but photosynthesis slows down in cooler temperatures because of these other processes that are affected by that. And then, uh, so we want to warm the air, or in some cases, we, again, we may want to cool the air depending on what what we're trying to do what we're trying to grow, how we're trying to extend the season for a specific crop. So let's look at these. Now, physical structures and tools then that we can use, protection kinds of things. We've got fences, we have row covers or low tunnels, we have wind breaks, we have shade cloth, high tunnels, cold frames, uh, wall of water types of things, hot caps, um, mulches. One other that I didn't put on here is raised beds. Uh, those kinds of things we are physical structures that we can use in our efforts to extend our growing season. Cultural practices then that we might be implementing here. Uh, okay, this is where I got the raised bed, sorry. Your water irrigation, your raised beds, air movement, and your microclimate, just just the location. Like I said, I, I'm starting to figure out where the cold spots are in my yard. Do you know where your cold and hot spots are in your yard? And that taking advantage of those microclimates themselves is kind of a cultural practice and you would grow plants based on, on that specific little microclimate in your yard. Protection from frost. Let's talk about frost protection. That's the one that we think about a lot when we're doing this. And so row covers, these are down here on the picture. These are the row covers. It's called, this is actually a tunnel within a tunnel. It's a high tunnel. It's got a tunnel inside of it. So you kind of got two things going on at one time, but you've got this row covers going and it's, it'll help a lot. Actually, you got the heat from the ground coming up and being trapped by that frost blanket. They will protect depending on, on the frost blanket. Generally they'll, they'll go anywhere from, four or five degrees down to about 10 degrees of protection. So you can get down to the low twenties with the right frost blanket and avoid damage to the tender crops. Not, not that they're going to grow very well, but, but you can avoid the frost damage. And then there's the high tunnel. The high tunnel itself uh, gives maybe four or five degrees protection. It kind of depends on the plastic you're using. 
on the high tunnel. So you'll, you get some frost protection from it, but uh, not as much as we would like to think because it's passive heating and cooling. So sometimes what I do, if it's going to be really cold, it's kind of cheating, but uh, you know, we do what we can. I, I'll put, I've got a little space heater that I'll put in my high tunnel if it's going to be really cold. And I did that uh, two or three nights this fall as, as things were winding down because I, I had uh, a little bit more time left in the market. So I, I tried to keep my tomatoes and things open and, and it did quite well. It kept the heat in, the plants did well, the, the tomatoes continued to ripen. And so, so you get a little bit of frost protection, but not as much as a lot of times we think we're going to get. Cold frames, now that's basically the cold frames are built fairly low to the ground. And so you've got a, kind of like the, the low tunnel, but it's usually a little bit more permanent of a structure, not necessarily. The wall of water, type of things. I think uh, I've got, I may have some pictures in here of, of how I do it. These wall of waters, are, they do very good job. If you can keep them from tipping over on your plants, uh, you've got these, these liter, two liter bottles filled with water. Now water as it cools is giving off heat. And so that's, that's the whole concept behind here. So as the, even as the water, as long as it's not totally frozen, it's still giving off heat and keeps the area right around it from getting frozen. Uh, that's, that's kind of the way that works, wall of water. Of course, your hot caps, now the hot caps, the, my dad used 175,000 years ago when I was a kid were just, you know, the wax paper type hot caps and, and they worked. I mean, that's how we, we've, one of the things we did to try to extend our growing season, get those plants out there and other things that we, we were doing, try to get that to work. There are better things now available to us. And so uh, I don't particularly care to use those. Anyway, uh, so that's the physical things that we can use to help protect against frost. Now, cultural practices, these are, these are things that we can do also to help. And one of the things that people will talk about a lot of times is, is irrigation water irrigation and I do, I did actually use this one this year too on my corn because with all the the, uh, the smoke from the California fires and things like that, it really slowed down my corn and we were getting into September and it was starting to get frost nights and so Labor, Labor Day weekend, we had a frost that weekend. My corn wasn't ready, it was just about ready to come on and because it had been slowed down by the smoke and everything. So I put, I, I put some water on it. And the concept behind the water is that as long as there is wet, you know, you get the ice forms, you say, well, the ice forms is gonna cause damage. The ice will never drop below 32 degrees as long as there's wet water on it. And so you put the, the sprinkler out there and it's getting wet on there and it freezes, but you still got wet water on it, the ice will never drop below that 32 degrees threshold, excuse me, that 32 degree threshold. And, and so that's the whole concept behind here. And it works, but you, but you have to be careful that you don't get really soggy ground or you get the ice will build up and you get too much weight and things start to tip over and break. Uh, the last time I did that on my corn, I was almost done with the season. And some of the plants were just bending over really heavy with that ice on them. So there are some disadvantages, especially when you're talking about fruit trees, you don't want to get ice build up on the branches of your fruit trees and break the branches off. So be careful using this one, but also keep in mind that you've got to keep that wet water on there until all the ice is gone. You can't turn it off and whether, while there's still ice in there because then all of a sudden, the wet water disappears, everything's frozen and the ice will get cold fast and then you'll start getting some tissue damage. So if you're going to use this technique, keep those things in mind. It works, you just have to be careful how you use it. All right, so um, air movement, especially you guys over there on the, on the uh, slopes there down by Homedale and whatnot in, Can in Canyon County, they have uh, big orchards. And so in big orchard areas, this air movement thing really does help. It pulls that warm air that's kind of up above and 
and mixes it down with the colder air and pushes that colder air up and out. And so this will help to protect for a while until temperatures get too cold. That's why they spend a lot of money on these big wind machines for these big orchards. And then of course, this microclimate, just choosing where to grow things. If you're on the sunny side, if you're on the south facing slopes, the, you're going to get that warming up a little bit better. Having a slope itself will let the cold air drain out as long as you're not down in the bottom of the drainage there so that you don't get that. So that, that microclimate, that location does have a big effect. Now, my, my garden area in Price was a slightly north facing slope. And so the, the soils were a little bit slower to warm up. But that's what I had to work with. Uh, if you've got those kinds of opportunities, though, to change where you're putting it on based on the slope, that, that would help as well. OK, so that's the frost protection. Now, wind protection, to me, in my opinion, would probably get just as much benefit if we can protect our plants from wind as we do when we protect our plants from frost. Now, we've got to protect them from frost to keep them from damaging tissue. But wind causes just as much damage when we, when we have to face that. And so, so we can use fences in our planning we've got fences in place here and there and so we can we put that in there we could do it with a like a temporary baffle like this one here is just something that's set up it just a mesh fence will help to slow the wind down and it may just and that may be enough that may be all that it's that is needed you could also um <clears throat> fasten your your baffling material to a permanent fence you have to be careful doing this though if you got really strong winds you can actually bend the fence and so be careful when, you, when you're doing it I, I had uh, a couple of incidents with that be careful also though when you're using fences and if the fence is on the downhill side you can pull cold air will pull against that and so I mean you can use that to your advantage but you don't want to have cold air pulling down there causing problems for your your tender crops all right we could also use row covers or low tunnels to help protect against wind this is one i was just i had some cabbage plants out and it was actually snow uh, on the plants but it was quite windy not quite as windy as it here is, is in eastern idaho this is in northern utah but uh, Price, Price, Utah was very windy. Eastern Idaho is very windy. And so we, we kind of need to protect against. So the low tunnels can do a lot to protect against the, the wind. And then windbreaks. So if you're going to be using a windbreak, kind of beware of comp competition for nutrients. I lived in an area up, up by Rexburg a number of years ago. The, it was a river bottoms, a lot of cottonwoods growing. And had great great uh, windbreak protection but those cottonwoods were always suckering up in my garden so kind of be aware of that so if you look at this farmstead my guess is the wind's coming mostly from this direction over here you want to be careful and those the garden is over here on the left side we've got the garden over here and the trees have been taken out we don't have trees there to compete with the new for nutrients or compete for sunlight and things like that so be aware of that competition that can come from the wind breaks with my place up there by rexburg i just i stopped gardening i've made it into pasture and i went over and gardened over at my father-in-law's place so I mean, you, you do with what you can do so be aware then of those situations and then a shade cloth, just having a shade cloth itself can help a lot with the wind protection. It just helps to break down the force of the wind. It doesn't stop the wind, but it can break down the force, show the, slow down the force of the wind. High tunnels, while the sides are down, if the sides are up, doesn't do any good. But if the sides are down, you get really good wind protection. And so in the springtime, especially, on this one, I would drop down uh, this side on the left was the was the wind windward side and so i would drop down that one and i would leave the leeward side on the right here is the one i would lift it up so i get my ventilation but i still getting wood, good wind protection and that was one of the best advantages with a high tunnel in my opinion was was just that wind protection so if you if you manage it correctly Cold frames can be good for wind protection as long as the plants are within 
you know, out of the wind on them. So once they get too big, then it's of course a big bit of a challenge there. Now here's a, here's another example. This is a really cheap cold frame, but by golly, I bet you that works pretty good. You got a screen door; it's got it propped over with a stick, with a stick, and you got your plants inside there, bales of straw around the outside. Again, it doesn't have to be an expensive structure for it to work well. And then the wall of water again, as long as the plants don't get too large, they do quite well. Now these again, the wall of waters, uh, not to complain against them, I struggle a little bit with those. So I had a little bit different system because of my high tunnels and I've made lots of mistakes. And so I had a lot of plastic left over on, on from my high tunnel things. I ended up making a lot of these tubes with the plastic and then I put milk jugs filled with water inside the plastic, the plastic, tube would keep the wind off and the milk jugs with water three two to three milk jugs inside there and I had I just did a trial there's no research uh, statistics applied to this but the temperatures got down to 17 degrees outside of the high tunnel and with this particular three jug thing I had watermelon plants that survived they didn't get frozen they didn't grow very well because the soil was still pretty cold I had a wall of water and then I had this, these here just to kind of test them against each other. And this did just as well as a wall of water did and you can make it yourself. Uh, uh, that wall of waters are kind of expensive and they always are leaking. One of the one of the tubes will leak and then they tip over onto your plants. And do, they do a good job if they function properly, but I just struggle with that. Again, and then the hot caps until they get too large. Now notice on this, uh, this cucurbit here, it's probably a squash plant, hard to tell kind of, but it looks like a, a cucumber, I mean. You look at this um, along the edge, it's not necrotic, it's not, it's kind of chlorotic, I guess, that, but that along the edge is an indication of not freezing, but chilling. So a lot of times you'll see that chilling early in the spring on these young plants. and. It, and that's usually what that is, is, is a little bit, just a little bit too cold. And, and so you get a little bit of chilling damage, but not, doesn't kill the plant. So you're getting it in there. And so when the gray days get going good, they'll grow fast. Uh, for wind, there's really no cultural things that we do that reduce the wind uh, on our plants. And so We'll skip over that. Now, soil temperatures, you know, we want to warm the soils or maybe we may even want to cool the soil temperatures. And the reason being here, again, just like the ambient temperatures, you have a minimum. The soil temperatures on these cool season crops, they'll germinate, they'll start germinating at these cool temperatures of 35, 40 degrees. They germinate a lot more evenly if you get into this optimum range. And then you got the maximum. When the soil temperatures get too hot, then they they won't germinate because uh, the mother nature says, nah, it's too hot for you. You want to stay where it's cool. So for the most part, then your optimum range for the cool season crops is typically between 45 or 50 degrees and then up to 80, 85. That's for germination. That's not the air temperature. Okay. Once we get the germination going and then the air temperature is important for the plants to continue growing, but the soil temperature for the germination and root growth. That's the cool season crops and then the warm season crops again you're looking at 50 60 degrees. You think well asparagus is not a really a warm season crop. Well that's true it's not really kind of but in order for germination it's got to be up there a little bit warmer. Again notice how the maximum is a lot higher quite a bit higher on these than it is on the cool season crops. Even the optimum is quite a bit higher. So we can get that soil warmed up, we can get faster germination. So soil warming uh, things, physical things we can do, row covers, uh, low tunnels, solarization, basically what that doing is it's trapping the heat into the soil, the, the heat goes through the plastic, gets into the soil, warms up the soil, it, it irradiates off from the soil, but it gets trapped on the plastic. And so it kind of keeps that heat onto the soil. I had uh, planted some corn under this high tunnel structure. And so I just put plastic over just for the fun of it. Now the, the picture is actually kind of deceptive. It looks like 
it looks like there's a lot more plants in there. In reality, they're planted just as closely together as here. It's just the perspective is different. But the plants were quite a lot larger in the high tunnel. And I did get corn on these plants about two weeks earlier than I did on the plants that were outside. Now, corn is not a viable enough crop to justify the expense of the high tunnel. It was just kind of a fun thing I was doing. And there, there, some folks down at Utah State did did a trial on that and put the economics to it. And they came to the same conclusion. Why you do get corn on a couple of weeks earlier, you, you don't, your markets, marketing is not going to be such that it's going to be, you're going to recover the cost from the cost of the high tunnel itself. And so, but, but the high tunnel does warm up that soil. That helps a lot. Cold frames, same kind of a thing. You get the soil warmed up and your crops will do quite a lot better. Wall of water. The thing about the wall of water is that the, the soil is going to be warmed up where the wall of water is, but not outside of the wall of water. And so you have a fairly small root zone there. Same kind of a thing with the hot cap. And then uh, man-made mulches. The black plastic, the plastic itself warms up and then it kind of transfers over to the soil. You don't get as much soil warming with the opaque plastic as you do with clear plastic. And so if you're looking to warm the soil up, clear plastic will warm it up faster, but it may get too, too hot. And so then, then you get that challenge to deal with. So your man-made mulches can help to warm the soil. And then the French hotbed, uh, Misha Hudman called and says, you can talk about French hotbed technique. And I've never used it. But basically what the French hotbed is, is, is you're growing on top of a compost pile. You put, you put and they always uh, use horse manure and horse manure is fine. You use horse manure in there and you put that down. And then on top of the horse manure, you're putting your growing medium. But th the challenges are, that temperature in that compost pile can get quite hot and it will damage the roots or restrict the root growth and it gets too hot, you know, up to 100, 130 to 160, even higher, higher than that sometimes. And so the roots won't grow down into that very well if it's too hot. And so you have to be careful. So some of the things they do to get this to work well is they, they compact that down. When you're doing a compost pile, you want as much oxygen in there because you want it to get the composting done as quickly as possible. With this system, they pack that down and they're kind of driving some of that oxygen down out so that it slows down that composting. So you're producing heat and you're heating up the, the soil where you got your crop growing and it, it works. I mean, this is one of the things that uh, I may start to implement something like this. You can use these in the high tunnel to produce heat so in late winter, early spring, you would get your high tunnel set up and put this, this uh, hotbed in there and, and get the composting going and then grow. You can grow actually right on top of the, the hotbed. You just have to manage it. There's a skill, kind of a science involved in, in managing that so that you don't get too hot for the roots and, and get it to work well. So uh, typically, Depending on where you're growing and how much time you've got, you may want to start this in the fall and get it to so so that in the springtime, as it starts to warm up, it gets past that worst of the heat in, uh, before you're actually starting to grow a crop in there. Now, in order to compost very well, you've got to have a fair amount of volume. And so you want, you typically we say you've got to have a, you know, a four by four by four cubic area in order for things to compost well, get that temperature up really good and do a good composting. These, they, they kind of compact that down into maybe two feet of compost and then however big and you, you got the boards there to keep it from losing a lot of heat through the sides. So again, the, the French hotbed method is something that's been used for decades or centuries. They've been using this technique for centuries to kind of help the plants get started. People actually even start their seedlings on here when it's a lot cooler than, than you would think outside 
and they'll warm up that they'll have that warm soil and they'll get things like your you know your carrots will get germinated and and your cabbage and things like that they'll germinate and come up so it's maybe I mean, you don't start your carrots indoors, but you, you, a lot of times you start a cabbage indoors. It may be a way of starting the cabbage outdoors and still get that benefit. And then you've got the roots established. You just have to be careful of, of that heat buildup underneath in that in this uh, hotbed method. Okay, uh, cultural things. Hey, Ron. Can, yeah. We had a question on how yeah. deep would the, um, I guess the compost material be on that hotbed? So most of them, and this is not one that I've used, but uh, the what I've looked at on the research and uh, the practitioners, they try to have that uh, eight at least eighteen inches deep packed down. So you've got most of that moisture, uh, most of the oxygen is out, and that just slows down the composting. So you've got to have oxygen and nitrogen and moisture to compost and then heat, but the, it usually produces its own heat. So those are the three, four things that you need for things to compost. If you drive out the oxygen, then you're not gonna have the composting happen as fast. So what they do is they pack it down to 18 to 24 inches of compacted compost. Then they put a growing medium on top of that. So I would put, Personally, I would put a minimum of six inches of growing medium on top of that. So typically this, this is all organic. It's not any soil minerals in this whole mix. Although I have seen some, some of them put a soil back on top of that, which, which would work too. So scientifically the concepts work, but you have to manage them properly. There's a lot of work that goes into it. So short, long answer to a short question. Uh, a minimum of 18 inches on that compost. You start getting shallower than that, you're really not going to get the heat buildup that you want. You need to have some heat buildup and for the composting to kind of take place. Okay, so uh, you can use water. Dark dark soils warm up faster than light colored soils. And so when they're, wa when they're wet, the darker color will actually absorb the heat better, but you have to be careful. So what you're doing is you're putting cold water on the soil. Well, that cools it off. And so I, I'm not sure that I would use water uh, as a method of warming the soil. Raised beds, the soil warms up faster. Hey Ron, yeah. We had one more question about okay. those hot beds. Okay. Um, they asked if antibiotics in the manure would be a concern. Okay, uh, that's a good question. I, I, well, everybody's got good questions. So, so anyway, uh, uh, not anti antibiotics probably not so much, although they could be. Uh, most most of your animals they don't put that much antibiotic stuff. Matter of fact, in order to get antibiotics into the feed, you have to have a veterinarian's prescription. They, they don't just put antibiotics into feed anymore. Used to do back when I was a livestock nutritionist uh, at a feed mill out there in Mud Lake. They had uh, low level antibiotics that would actually improve feed efficiency, kinds of things. You can't do that anymore. You've got to have a veterinarian's prescription in order to put any antibiotics into the feed. So antibiotics are not an issue. However, pesticides, herbicides can be an issue. You want to make sure that you, you check with wherever your source of is that they haven't been feeding on a pasture that's been sprayed with. The worst one is, is milestone or amino pyrrolid is the chemical name. You don't want to be using that manure in your garden because it will kill your garden. It passes right through the animal. And so the herbicides would be more of an issue in the garden than the antibiotics would be. You know, every now and again, they have to give an animal antibiotic shot to keep them healthy and all that kind of stuff. But they don't do that as a general rule. That's an expensive practice. And so they don't do that unless the animals are truly sick. And so I would just be careful, uh, make sure that the, whoever, wherever you're getting your manure for that, that you have, a, you know the source of the feed that's passing through that animal. Someone asked for a list of the pesticides to be aware of. The, well, okay, the worst one is, is uh, 
a product called amino pyrrolid and it has on the label it has a warning to that effect that you don't want to use the manure from plants that have been treated with with amino pyrrolid milestone is the most common uh, brand name for it milestone but there are other um, combinations of with that amino pyrrolid in it that have it in there and so that's what you would be that's what you'd be looking for the most other things that have a fair amount of soil activity that may cause problems would be tillar or uh, escort escort is met sulfuron and tillar is chlorosulfuron there's a fair amount of soil activity with those most of them will break down over a fairly fairly short period of time after it's passed through and it's in the manure and things like that. That amino pyrrolid is the one that really, really gets people. And so that's the one you want to watch out for. And that, regardless of whether you're doing it in a French hotbed or you're just putting uh, in your compost pile and then putting it into your garden, you don't, uh, that's the one you want to avoid by, uh, uh, in all cases. Okay, one thing you want to be careful of on these raised beds, it does warm up the soil faster. However, in this case, you may actually, where you have a, a wall that's significantly higher than the soil level, I would have that soil level up close to the top of the wall, if at all possible, because the cold air will kind of settle into there and, and while your sun radiant energy is warming up the soil, the cold air trapped there may kind of counteract a little bit so on these raised beds i would be be careful of having too high of a wall around it again the microclimate your soil the the slope the south raised sunny slope is going to warm up faster than the north side slope will now cooling the soil may be important to too one of the things that i this is uh, some fruit trees I had here as on the north side of this, this neighbor's fence. And the soil kept cooler. And so my apple trees along here, I, I, apples and peaches I planted along here were slower to come out of dormancy because the soil temperatures stayed cooler a little bit longer. Once the soil temperature usually on most of these plants gets up around 40 degrees, a lot of times the roots will start growing on these trees. It depends on the species again, but but a fence can be used to help slow down the the spring bud break on, on plants as well. Organic mulches will also help to cool the soil as opposed to warming the soil. If you put organic mulch down uh, and you want the soil to be warming up, that organic match is actually going to slow the cool, the warming process up. And so you want to actually pull that organic mulch away to get the soils to warm up. Well, if you want the soils to cool or stay cool, one of the best things you can do for your broccoli and your cauliflowers, you're getting into the summer season, just when they're starting to bloom, is to put a good mulch cover over the top of the soil to keep that ground from getting too hot and then the roots will do better the plants will actually do better just one of those simple practices there and then row covers actually depending on the material you're using for example this this agribond material actually helps to kind of keep it cool because you don't get quite as much light transmission as you do with the clear plastic so it actually reduces the amount of light that's getting onto the plant now it does trap the heat as it builds up in the soil and so kind of counteracts a little bit but in the springtime when you don't have quite as direct sunlight on there it does help to keep things uh, the soil cooler irrigation as long as the ground is shaded irrigation is actually going to cool the soil and i talked about using water to warm the soil you know kind of sort of well it's in reality the evaporation from irrigation is going to help to keep that soil cooler as long as you've got shade on the ground as opposed to sunlight and then again, your selection, your site selection, the microclimate location kind of a thing. Okay, so that's the soil, cooling and heating and warming and cooling the soil. Again, the whole point with that hotbed uh, situation is that you're growing uh, 
you're basically growing on a compost pile and you're using the heat from the composting to warm the soil. That's the, the hotbed concept. Warming the air now. Air is really critical, not just not just frost protection, but we're, we need to warm the air to get up into that sweet spot of temperature for plant growth. So using row covers or low tunnels can help get that air temperature up there warm quicker in the day. High tunnels can do, I mean, they get the temperature up there again, you have to manage it so it doesn't get too hot because it can get up there quite quickly early in the day and you get a lot of good growth growing there. Cold frames, again, you're warming that temperature up. Wall of water. The nice thing about the wall of water, not only does it give off heat when it's freezing, the when the water is warming up, it's absorbing heat. And so you can actually warm the air when it's giving off heat, but it also can kind of cool the air too when you're giving hot. So the wall of water and the hot cap kinds of things used to warm the air. And then um, other than microclimate with a warmer air, basically there's no other cultural actions that I can come up with that, that would increase your warm, your air, air temperature itself. So that's warming the air and then cooling the air. Shade cloth uh, is a great tool for cooling the air. So on my high tunnels, when it gets hot, I put on a shade cloth to help keep things so, and that will help to protect the fruit so we don't get the sunburn damage on the fruit nearly as bad. The problem with this year was not only did I have the shade cloth on there and it's not something I just take on and off and on and off really quickly. We also had a lot of uh, smoky air and so it actually kind of slowed down the photosynthesis. I wasn't getting as much sunlight from the photo for photosynthesis. So I had the temperature in the right zone and the, temp, uh, the photosynthesis kind of slowed things down. So my yield's probably not quite as good this year as I would hope for because of that one thing. Anyway, the shade cloth does really help to cool things. You walk into a high tunnel that's got a shade cloth on it from outside. And it's just amazing how much cooler it feels in there. Using irrigation again for evaporation and cooling. Okay. Any questions? Season extension, it's a lot of fun. I, I have been growing in high tunnels since 2006. The high tunnel is a total different topic in and of itself. And it takes about an hour. <laughs>